we're going to get started. Um, and I'd like to start off by first indicating that it's quite ironic that I'm here today. Uh, because I'm probably the least tech-savvy person I know. So you'll have to bear with me. <laughs> I'm the person who the uh, IT guy at work constantly has to hover around to try and, and sort out my laptop and anything electronic dies around me. So, uh, But I will try and be a, a welcoming, gracious host to make you feel welcome today. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, whether you're from an agribusiness, an agri-organization, uh, some of our government departments, research institution, institutions, uh, we also like to extend a special welcome to um, representatives from the Embassy of Brazil here in South Africa, as well as the Embassy of the Czech Republic, uh, as well as the Embassy of the Republic of Kazakhstan here in South Africa. Thank you for attending today's event. Uh, to all of you, um, a warm and hearty welcome. On behalf of the agri Africa team. It's great to see you and to look forward to what is hopefully going to be an incredible event early next year. Um, the inaugural AAT conference held in February of 2020 was the biggest agricultural event of that year because it was the only event that year. <laughs> Very shortly after COVID-19 hit, uh, stopped the world in its tracks. Um, and we're thrilled to be able to continue that success, uh, the success of the first uh, AAT event in 2023. Um, and it's great to have you all at today's launch. So what do we know? Personally, um, I've worked in news for 10 years. Uh, so I can say with some authority that agriculture is usually in the news for a couple of things. Drought, floods, locusts land issues, labor issues, and of course, food security is arguably the biggest buzzword, not only locally here in South Africa, but across the world as well, uh, amid various uncertainties. We're reminded time and time again that as per estimates compiled by the Food and Agriculture Organization, that by 2050, we'll need to produce 60% more food to feed a world population of 9.3 billion. But agriculture is about more than just food. You are all experts, so you probably know this, but I didn't, and I was quite shocked and surprised, pleasantly surprised, to learn that when ESCOM load shedding strikes again, like it did this morning, stage four at 6 a.m., and you reach for the less than romantic candles, Cornstarch is a key ingredient in the manufacturing of matches. Cornstarch is also used to make toothpaste, spark plugs, and lipstick. Soya bean oils are used in the manufacture of AstroTurf because it's better for the environment, more economically viable, and it lasts longer than traditional fluids. Soy-based hydraulic fluids have become a mainstay in hydraulic machinery. All things that I didn't know. Perhaps you did. So agriculture plays a role in even the tiny details of our everyday lives that we take for granted. And we know that technology is playing an increasingly important role, both in primary production as well as in the value chain, uh, in order to increase yields, profitability, and sustainability, more words that we hear quite often. As agricultural technology advances, more and more mainstream media, in my experience, in newsrooms, uh, are engaging with hot topics. Lo and behold, agriculture may even be becoming sexy. And that's from my personal experience over the past 10 years, where initially, uh, in my, the start of my journey in newsrooms, we very rarely covered any agricultural events. It was literally the outliers, farm murders, some drastic development, um, and most often uh, land issues, which in South Africa are a very sensitive issue, is a sensitive issue for very many reasons. However, we're hoping that as technology advances, agriculture will be in the news more and more often for the right reasons. But we have to look at what that technology looks like. Past advances, we know, were mostly mechanical, uh, the in the form of more powerful and efficient machinery, and genetic in the form of more productive seeds and fertilizer. Now, much more sophisticated digital tools are needed to deliver the next productivity leap. 
going forward, the buzzwords are going to be changing. And we've put some of them on the screen here behind me for you to look at. Uh, those are the things that ultimately we're going to be looking at, at in AAT 2023. Many of our conversations about agriculture in the past here in South Africa have been focused on everything up to the farm gate. But what happens beyond that? What happens between the farm gate and the fork? We say farm to fork, but very rarely in our discussions do we include that journey from the end of primary production, that part of the value chain where agro-processing, distribution, packaging, logistics, all of those things lie. And in those elements, uh, technologies are going to advance at an incredibly rapid pa pace. And therein lies so many of the opportunities to leverage uh, the progress in agriculture. Enabling producers to capitalize on the expansion into the value chain. So what does the future of agriculture look like? And I spent a little bit of time online looking at lots of different quotes from famous people, from not so famous people, and they have a lot of different things to say about agriculture. Strangely enough, a lot of the quotes online about agriculture are quite old. So we're looking for, for people to contribute positively in that way as well, to, to offer these catchphrases, these meaningful suggestions of what agriculture looks like going forward. But one thing I did find that I found quite profound, um, and I'm not a sci-fi fan, um, but Arthur C. Clarke, he, maybe some of you will remember, he was the co-writer of A Space Odyssey, and he was a science fiction author. He said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indis indistinguishable from magic. And I think therein lies quite a big challenge for the agriculture and technology sectors to intersect and find that magic. I've been exploring emceeing a little bit more regularly lately, and it's a bit of a running joke in our office that my jokes, when I'm standing up front here, tend to fall flat. So I'm going to take a chance and, and hope that because a large portion of you are also academics, that you'll, that you'll find my joke funny. The factory of the future will only have two employees, a man and a dog. The man is there to feed the dog. The dog is there to make sure the man doesn't touch the equipment. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so we've put together a little video to showcase Africa Agritech of the past. Uh, let's take a look. Africa Agritech, bringing together top-level professionals for three days of discussions, exhibits and networking. AAT is dedicated to connecting the Southern African agriculture, scientific and technology communities. It delivers premium insights, best-in-class presentations and explores global trends and advances in agriculture. Three days of in-person sessions, panel discussions, startup pitches and one-on-one -on -one networking opportunities, initiating high-value connections, facilitating long-lasting business relationships. The event has welcomed delegates from around the world, with close to 2,500 attendees from 18 countries and over 40 conference sessions with more than 60 speakers. The event garnered high praise from industry leaders. It's no surprise that efficient, sustainable and profitable technological solutions for agriculture top the agenda at this year's big Africa Agri-Tech conference. You were just saying that, you know, every time you think about agriculture, even farming, you think about dirty boots and you think about, you know, crops. But this event is making your industry quite sexy, I have to say. I think that's a very nice thing to have. At last, we have a sexy industry. You <laughs> spot on boots, cows, dung, all those things is normally associated. But this really gives uh, everyone the understanding that agriculture is much more than the crop cycle. It includes a whole industry and all the technology that surrounds that industry showcased here today. I think this was a very interesting topic. This was a lot of people. I think people have a good idea of where the land is. 
En ek dink ook een goeie oorzig oor hoe goed die landbouwtechnologie is wat ons eindelijk in Zuid-Afrika ontwikkel. Jy weet goed soos Agritech Innovation, jy weet Kobus van Koller van Viljoenskroon, wat gepraat het van al die technologie wat hy en sy behoederheid gebruik. Die ouwens wat die digitale vee veilings doen, BKB met hulle blokketting technologie. Dit is alles snijk aan technologie, alles wat hier in Zuid-Afrika ontwikkel word. En die positiviteit daarvan is, jy krij die energie om, uh, om voorstellen te maak, energie om deel te neem in die gesprekke, en natuurlijk die energie om zeker te maken dat ons hopelijk in die 10 jaar kan terugkijk en sê, wel ons die deel geneem aan de verandering in Zuid-Afrika. Africa Agritech received extensive media coverage, featuring over 100 online articles, over 7 hours on radio and television, and extensive social media attention. Africa Agritech acknowledges the support of sponsors, industry associations and media partners. Africa Agritech, see you there. And because we're seeing you here, we automatically assume we will see you there. So we look forward to that as well. We're going to tell you a little bit more about Africa Agritech in just a little bit. Uh, but before we get to that, we'd like to tickle your technological taste buds, if we may, with some insights uh, from a couple of guest speakers. Uh, first up, we have invited Priyash Ramadin from the Awareness Company. He's going to talk to us on the subject of data. Priyash, welcome. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's a great honor and privilege to be here. It's a little surreal as well. The last time I was at the Africa Agritech launch was three years ago. Uh, and as we know, all the chaos has happened and it's really great to be here again and I'm really, really looking forward to next year's event. So my name is Priyash. I'm the co-founder of the Awareness Company and we tell stories from data across a multitude of different sectors and agriculture is a big part of the work that we do going forward. So a little bit of what we do, we enable the agricultural sector and the industry and value chain to make data-driven decisions with what we call data storytelling. Um, we are currently deployed on farms, we are deployed on uh, with agri-organizations, uh, and we're currently running a large smallholder focused program with Microsoft South Africa, uh, where we've learned a lot of lessons about technology, about the market, about education of agri-tech. It's all vital and it's all needed. So I'm going to start off by going through some definitions. And I think it's really, really important when we talk about technology and data that we all need to be on the same baseline. Uh, and that's really important. So we talk about precision agriculture, but what is it? And there's a lot of buzzwords when it comes to data and technology. But for me, the, the definition that we all need to focus on is on what are we trying to get after? What's the output? What's the goals? And that really is still about maximizing quality profit. And now what's come into the conversation is sustainability. This is important. Sustainability is no more this nice to have. Uh, it needs to bring and come into the conversation. And if we're all on the same page of the definitions of precision agriculture, then we can start talking about, okay, what technology can I utilize? How do I leverage data? What's the sensor that's gonna help me? And so forth. So I think it's really important. Let's start off on the, on the same baseline definition. So data, what is it good for? Absolutely everything from my perspective. Uh, but data really gives us two things it gives us a first level awareness as to what's going on. Typically, what we've seen is we're all in a very reactive state. Uh, and what data and technology starts to uncover, it gives us this first level awareness of, hey, what's going on on the ground? Whether you're a farmer or whether you're an agribusiness or whether you're a financier supporting farmers or so forth, it gives us that first level awareness. The second thing that data gives us is this deeper level understanding as to what's going on. So there's many different levels to our understanding on the ground and data helps us uncover each one and go deeper. But fundamentally, at the end of the day, it's all about enabling better decisions and better actions. And Humans, they say, are not really great at multitasking. Data is fantastic at multitasking. Technology is fantastic at it. So we can do sustainability activities and precision agricultural acti activities. We don't need to compromise on that. And this is what technology gives us. They call it a force multiplier. 
uh, and that, that's the key. So the interesting thing about nature-based solutions is that usually they're not physical commodities that can be delivered. Okay? In the agricultural world, there's produce uh, and so forth. But if we're talking about sustainability, how do we, what do we deliver? Uh, how do we prove this? So just show of hands, uh, how many people know what a digital twin is uh, in the audience here? If you know what it is, hands up. So not too many, so uh, I think I counted about four or five hands. So a digital twin is a terminology that is used to replicate the physical world in a digital form. So a simple example is that we want to take a farm. We want to digitally replicate what's going on in the farm and create a bi-directional link of information from the farm in a digital world. And that also helps us, as they say, get paid. Now, the getting paid specifically component speaks about one example is everyone's talking about carbon credits and we're talking about sustainability, but we need that data, we need that evidence, we need that, that traceability value chain. This is where technology comes in. So this is a quote that I've taken from the World Agritech um, Innovation Summit that happened in San Francisco 2022. So the idea here is to build these bridges and use data and technology to build the bridges and this is now spawning a whole new level of what they're calling value and supply chains. Uh, so it's no, no longer the traditional one. There's a, ho there's a whole digital supply chain. And, and data is, is helping us sort of navigate that. So uh, in the audience, I assume there's a wide range of different stakeholders in different types of agricultural organizations. So when you look at this table, just place yourself in either one or multiple columns on the value chain. Um, the, the hostess uh, uh, spoke about the agri-value chain. Um, and this is really critical. Data and technology isn't only on the ground for the farmers. It's also for the inputs and the supplies, the logistics, the distribution, the packaging. The customer themselves, the fork side, wants to know the story behind the food now. Uh, more and more, that's more important. Data and technology is going to help give those answers. Uh, and there's a benefit of data across this entire value chain. So we are looking at that entire value chain. And I spoke about the new supply and value chains. Uh, the summit again highlighted three key challenges when it comes to talking about sustainability and technology. It's data capture, data sharing, and data privacy. Now thankfully, these are, they are existing mature technologies, companies that are working with these type of things to alleviate and fill the gaps that the agricultural industry is having at the moment. Um, and it's not, again, if you look at the, the value chain, it's not just about the farmers or the offsets that they can produce from the sustainability. I'm talking about carbon and sequestration and all of those things. But it's also the insets from the larger companies. Larger companies have climate goals. They have sustainability goals. So what this actually means is there's a new opportunity for partnership when we're working. And, and data, really, and technology is that glue that's going to help strengthen those partnerships. So my, my co-founder, Estelle, who's in the audience today, this is her famous line. You can't improve what you can't measure, and you can't influence what you have no awareness of. And this holds true for anything. If we want to start looking at data and agriculture and farming, and precision tech and agricultural security and sustainability technology, we have to know what we're talking about and we have to have on the ground real-time information flowing and that means we're measuring and once we measure, we can start influence. But if we, if we keep doing the same practices we're doing, we're not going to have any awareness and we're always going to be in a reactive state. And that's, that's my main message I want to sort of leave you with. But data is difficult. Let's not make any mistake. Data is something that's difficult. Each data project that you embark on, just show of hands, how many of you work with data, whether it's a spreadsheet or a mobile application or a data lake or something complicated? OK, cool. This is awesome. So I like to see a lot of hands up. because This is great. Everyone is working with data. So you would know it's not trivial. It's, it's something that is difficult. And we need to find more ways to streamline the difficulty so we're not duplicating efforts. Uh, the top normal data value chain makes it difficult. 
it's hard. So we are trying to find ways to be more efficient, to short circuit that. So as organizations, we're focusing on what data we need and we're focusing on how we utilize it. So I am an entrepreneur, so if someone puts me on, in, in front of an audience, I will sell a little bit. It's by my nature. So introducing Hydra. Hydra is uh, the awareness company technology that we use to facilitate a data journey. Uh, and we abstract all of the buzzwords, artificial intelligence, the internet of things, data analysis, um, and we bring that together in simple, easy to use interfaces which we call data stories. So we are firm believers of presenting information in an easy to use way, whether it's for the farmer, small holder, medium sized, large farmer, whether it's for the agribusiness, whether you're in grain, whether it's for the financiers or the insurers, everyone has a place to utilize data and technology going forward. And it shouldn't be in the form of a spreadsheet or your typical ERP or CRM system. It should be aesthetic. It should be something that you are, that's joyful. And that's one of our missions as well. Agricultural data should be sexy, as we've heard uh, going forward. So, so, and it can be. So, there's many, many data sources. If you look at this picture and you identify with one of the data sources, they, from a sustainability perspective, particularly, you know, whether it's still doing the soil samples, mobile data capture, making that more friendly, doing drone flyovers, uh, using IoT Internet of Things, that sensors and devices, whether it's soil moisture or CO2 sensors or environmental sensors, uh, take a holistic approach and ask yourself, okay, in my world, which data sources do I need? What do I need to make the difference that I'm looking and the outputs that I'm looking to get to? So we will not get to scale if we continue to rely on the same ways we've been doing things historically. Uh, you know, we wanna, how do we scale this? If we're talking about global sustainability on a wider scale, how do we get to this in the next few years and not have to wait for the next 20 years? So I'm talking about utilizing more data, more technology, and an ecosystem of people coming together. We are a technology startup, that's our role, we are the data side. We wanna partner with farmers, with agri-organizations, with larger companies, with government departments, all of us coming together, targeted at one goal, and data and technology being the goal. Thank you for listening to this very shortened talk. I can talk for this for hours, so here are my details if anyone wants to chat further, uh, but thanks for having us this morning. Are you ready to transform your farm with technology? Technology that you can access anywhere, anytime. To operate more efficiently, improve your yield, save time and money, keep your farm safe and get peace of mind. It's time to grow with Hydra, a holistic agriculture solution by The Awareness Company. Thank you very much, Priyash. So we've lined up more than one speaker for you today, uh, and we are very privileged to be joined uh, by Dr. Manashri Jagmohan Naidu, I hope I said that correctly, <laughs> Director for Agricultural Biotechnology at the Department of Science and Innovation. Thank you, Doctor. And thank you for the opportunity uh, to address you today on this very exciting uh, occasion. And having been at the Agritech 2020, um, I think there are exciting times ahead. Following from Priyash's um, presentation, I think being a government official, of course, uh, my talk is a little bit more policy focused and about how we're doing it. But I think there's three things that I want to pick up from, from um, Priyash's talk, is, and, and these are when we look at data and how it impacts what we do, it's the issue of relevance, which data, which technology, for what purpose. Secondly, the issue of access. How do we set ourselves up so that everybody has access to the same data systems, to validate scientific information that allows us to move forward? And the last uh, in terms of really informing and harnessing and building on the systems that we, that we have. And the last point is the issue of uh, sustainability. And I like the fact that he talked about partnerships. 
So a lot of my talk, while it might be a little bit more policy and research focused, I'll try to bring in the, the real, these three aspects into it. So just a quick overview, because I thought for this talk, because we're talking about uh, Agritech Africa, what are the, some of the key policy frameworks for agricultural innovation in Africa? And really how, uh, in terms of a bioeconomy, how are countries in Africa uh, positioning themselves to innovate in terms of a bioeconomy? And lastly, the, the South African implementation, and I'll talk to you a little bit around the partnerships that we have are trying to build. So I think it's very clear without going into the detail. Um, I've not been known for giving short talks. <laughs> I may be short, <laughs> uh, but I just want to touch, and I'm, I'm happy to share the presentation um, later, but we, we definitely have sufficient policy guiding us in terms of how we build an inclusive and sustainable agriculture across Africa. Secondly, uh, in terms of uh, making sure that through these policies they inform how and lead us in terms of building, building knowledge base and in an innovation-led society. And that is coming from STISA 2024. Food security, as already mentioned, is critical not only in terms of household food security but national food security in terms of many African countries. Um, and so within that, if we want to eradicate hunger and ensure food and nutrition security, there's also a case for how do we increase investment in agricultural R&D. Uh, there's a new AU EU innovation agenda looking at how we support sustainable and inclusive growth uh, and job creation. And once again, building on a key thing, that, a take home from this strategy is how do we make it real? How do we bring it home such that the technology we invest in impacts the lives of people? Um, moving on, um, just in terms of the definition of the Molabio Mon Montpellier panel on what is a bioeconomy. Um, so it says a bioeconomy is the production, utilization, and conservation of biological resources including related knowledge, science, technology, and innovation to provide information, products, processes, and services across all economic sectors towards a sustainable economy. Of course, here we're talking more on the agricultural sector, uh, but just homing in on this study. And there were four case studies that were done for Africa. That the study report was released in 2020, and they looked at how we use biomass and our global innovation index to choose which countries they would reflect on. And this is looking both in terms of the innovation index, both input and output innovation measures. And so it's really about how do we set ourselves up in terms of having innovative institutions, facilitating innovation activities, supporting human capital development, uh, infrastructure, market sophistication, uh, and business sophistication. And outputs are then really the, the, the outputs from innovation activities and really in terms of building that knowledge uh, society. So the focus was on Ghana, Namibia, Uganda, and South Africa, uh, as these were considered uh, four countries with uh, the highest uh, uh, propensity to support bioeconomies in Africa. And now in terms of Ghana, maybe uh, just to mention, so Ghana has a rich plant and animal biodiversity, and they focus on agriculture, forestry, energy, and waste management. Uh, but they have started to support industries for cashew, shear, and their byproducts. They also have support for their tertiary institutions in terms of science, technology, and innovation. And they have used public-private partnerships to advance uh, the development of their herbal medicines and, and take it into standard healthcare delivery. The second country uh, I just want to home in on is Namibia, um, who also has positioned STI as a key enabler in the country. And they have focused on the importance of gay meat and developing those food value chains. Uh, so just a, in the next country is South Africa that they focused on. And given that we really, and I'll talk to, in a minute about some of the things that we're doing, but we are, have the most advanced bioeconomy in, in Africa. 
And this is due to the fact that we have good IP systems, we have good collaboration and good policies that support uh, small businesses, that also support a, a leading biopharmaceutical and biotechnology sector. So incidentally, uh, we've just recently uh, in the health sector been awarded uh, uh, the, uh, what they call, the WHO calls maturity level three in terms of vaccine manufacturing capabilities. The highest level is four, so we've been uh, awarded level three, which I think is quite an achievement, particularly through our efforts in uh, developing that tech transfer hub. The last country they looked at was Uganda, and Uganda has quite a number of incubators at Makere University and the Uganda Industrial Research Institute, which supports bioenterprises. Uh, bio uh, they also have are promoting the domestication and commercialization of traditional medicines and biopharmaceuticals. Now, some of the key things to take away from this study was that uh, it really uh, we need to, to really identify gateway sectors to which to in, in, initiate development of transition to a bioeconomy, strengthen links of R&D to markets because the market is very important, uh, develop the demand. Um, if there's insufficient demand for a product that you're developing, it won't really have and generate the value. Um, also set up of national advisory boards to inform and guide the development of bioeconomies. Um, the next part that I'm going to talk to is about the South African experience and key enablers for implementation. Our agricultural bioeconomy in South Africa, uh, we have good uh, science, and our science uh, researchers have some of the greater than the world average in terms of science scientific uh, citation indices, but, and we have good systems for supporting entrepreneurship as well as tech transfer and commercialization. But we need to ensure that we invest more in terms of venture capital investment, in terms of getting technologies in the market. Because we have good science and we invest in good science, but we need to get those products. We need them to be used to, for the benefit of society. So it's the, really the issue of where should we be in intervening to improve in in efficiency, but also how we should be intervening. Uh, in terms of South Africa and our do new decadal plan uh, and our priorities for agriculture, we're really guided by our new decadal plan, uh, looking at how we can modernize productive sectors of the economy, such as agriculture, mining, and manufacturing. Now, in terms of agriculture um, and, and you know, guidance through the decadal plan is that there needs to be inclusivity and transformation, as well as an environment that supports partnerships, creativity, learning, entrepreneurship. So at the moment, we're busy developing an STI roadmap for agriculture, but we started already with our, agri with our bioeconomy strategy, of which agriculture is a key pillar in terms of how we use technology to support socioeconomic impact. Technology. <laughs> Secondly, um, just in terms of our agricultural bioeconomy, the theory of change of how innovation, science, technology, and innovation, and innovation is becoming the key buzzword, can revitalize agriculture is that through key interventions, outputs, and outcomes in agriculture to address the key challenges that we face, we can support increased growth. We can support decision support tools that help us to promote productivity and incomes, and we saw some of that through some of the digital agriculture. Uh, we can also support inclusion and competitiveness, and the way we do that is through crop or plant or animal improvement programs, animal improvement, agro-processing, um, also value chain analysis, and I've got an example in terms of First, identifying what is the key opportunity in a value chain. And whilst we focus on ensuring that we cross the divide between the first and second economy and support new and emerging farmers to become commercialized, we also want to support digital technology that enables us to do this more precisely, more efficiently, 
And we want to do this through coordination, facilitation, and multidisciplinary and multi-institutional agricultural innovation programs to drive these productive value chains. Um, this slide then just sort of mentions uh, one of our key instruments, which is the ABA program, which does exactly that. And our implementation agency is the Technology Innovation Agency. We work with many partners, of course, including co-funding bodies, government, RDI, farmer development organizations, as well as private sectors and international organizations. Um, I'm not going to go into this slide, but I just, I just want to home in on this slide here. Now, in terms of modernizing agriculture, uh, a lot of our focus is on molecular breeding, breeding cultivars that are resistant uh, to pests and diseases, but also drought tolerant. Um, and we also want to focus on smart digital and precision agriculture as a means to ensure that we increase such efficiency. Now, modern agriculture provides us with many uh, tools and technologies, but we also need increased access, like I've mentioned at the beginning, in terms of decision support tools that impacts on farming operations with increased accuracy, speed, reliability and agility of the systems to be able to respond when there is a, a crisis. And some of the examples, I mentioned the molecular breeding for resistance to pests and, and drought tolerance. There's also a lot of work being done on phenotyping indoor uh, and in field, as well as cutting edge platforms for decision support and efficient planning and management of agricultural fields. Monitoring crop health in real time trying to address, identify stresses early. Um, and there are a number of, uh, of projects on the ground, and I'll mention one or two. Predictive modeling, um, really looking at how uh, we can model microclimatic conditions to be able to predict uh, disease outbreaks. Um, Multi-sensor data, satellite technology using remote sensing and drones. Uh, for predictive modeling, so uh, an example is a CSIR precision agriculture information system. Uh, secondly, smart farming using data from long-term rotational trials that uh, help, help us to assist uh, farmers who, and reduce input, input and increase yields. And these really focus on, you know, really helping farmers what to plant, when to plant, uh, mitigation, seasonal effects, the issues around climate change. Um, the through loop system, which really yeah, assists with water use efficiency, and the National Biosecurity Hub, which we, 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 we just launched last week, which combines crop protection research, data collection, and warehousing to develop an open access platform for decision making. And that is really where we want to make sure that they scientifically validated, collated information uh, across the sector that helps us to do that. Um, one of our oldest flagships uh, is the wheat breeding platform. And so while the department invests in pre-breeding work, uh, there is also support from industry, uh, from uh, industry to sector uh, to support the breeding work. And, and this is uh, proved to be a win-win situation uh, where we are able to complement uh, the investments that we, we make. And there have been over 30 new cultivars released since 2015 by the individual breeding programs such as ARC, Syngenta and Cotiba. But there's also a lot of work also being done on phenotyping and really looking at uh, indoor um, uh, and outdoor uh, phenotyping to look at how we can speed up the way in which we deliver new cultivars to the market. Uh, I won't go into the detail of this, but digitizing the action of phenotyping makes it more repeatable, the data is less biased, and it's transferable between labs. Now some of the applications that are currently uh, out there it's terrestrial-based imaging field tools, making use of multispectral uh, thermal cameras, such as LIDAR. Um, set, because really, you want to monitor not only indoor, uh, uh, your breeding indoor, but you want to do, uh, well, you also want to monitor outdoor in terms of 
analyzing the capability of the cultivars that you develop for the market. Hyperspectral imaging, um, um, processing such as near infrared, lucid imaging for fruit sorting at pack shed, and using um, uh, this technology, you can actually look at the quality uh, of the fruit. Secondly, research on weed breeding, uh, where you can look at a single kernel, looking at the protein moisture or kernel hardness. These are very important in terms of the preliminary steps, in terms of making your product market ready and determining whether it, it really will yield the value at, in, in, once it's in the market. The use of drones with multispectral uh, imaging uh, in wheat improvement, where we've actually shown that it can assist with monitoring increased yields. Uh, seed counter based on uh, kernel imaging. Uh, this is bulk counting of seeds. Um, from a company called Data Technologies, which actually allows you to do this with increased speed and accuracy. Programmable seed color, uh, uh, shape, and size sorter, uh, which really looks at seed sorters for grain. Where it's a fractionator which removes impurities and provides a shelf quality, uh, shelf ready quality food. In terms of techno-economic feasibility studies. Before you invest in a particular technology, it's also important to map the value chain, to look at the real opportunity before you look at where, what in an innovation you want to, to, to invest in and how it will create that impact. What are the key bottlenecks in the value chain uh, that need to be unbundled in order for your product to be realized in the market? So this is a study that the DSI completed, and we've got various other techno-economic feasibility studies that we're doing. For example, in canola, where we're looking at how uh, can canola grow in the Eastern Cape, now that you know, the West is getting drier. Um, uh, looking at cassava, as well as uh, looking at marula, before we put up a factory to produce high-quality marula oils, can we get the supply and demand side right? Um, we've done some very good work on the Cape Aloe value chain development, and this is really looking at uh, entrepreneurs who've de developed uh, cosmetics and now looking at how we can get those entrepreneurs to develop their businesses so that they can put this product in the market. Nutrition security. Now, as we support increase, this is a critical in terms of. Uh, nutrition support, security, curbing malnourishment. As a farmer plants grain, he needs to be able to plant other nutritious crops that help assist with household food security in terms of combating malnourishment, etc. So we've invested in some of these technologies that look at uh, nutrient dense and drought, drought tolerance in traditional and indigenous crops, amadumbe, bambara, groundnut, and leafy vegetables. And part of this is really about access to the technology, about communities setting themselves up. So we had the KwaZulu Natal Smallholder Association form um, uh, being developed, and we, we had the transfer and training of the farmers to produce this with the idea that they would develop businesses. Uh, and this is sort of on the go. And we, ha we work with quite a number of partners. There are other projects that we also work with the oil and protein seeds industry on the processing of soybean. And that is really to look at how on farm, uh, in, in, in small enterprises, they can produce yogurt, soy snacks, etc., which is really about that increased protein content in the diet. The National Biosecurity Hub uh, was launched by the DSI and the Minister of Agricultural Land Reform and Rural Development. Outbreaks of pests and diseases uh, result in increased losses, they reduce yields, they reduce food security and quality, and they disrupt trade. So we need integrated pest management and innovation, and the National Biosecurity Hub is really about a partnership program in terms of how we can strengthen our biosecurity and use international standards to develop national sanitary and phytosanitary systems, also support the technical and information management systems to meet the SPS requirements of international trade. 
The platform will, serve, uh, will assist us to prevent, respond and manage pest diseases, conduct research on known and emerging threats, uh, develop a biosecurity information hub, which has already started, uh, which has already started looking at the data warehousing of scientifically validated information across the country from different research programs. And it's really about building those systems that have the pest lists, that have the information on what are the new threats on the horizon, having the scientific capability to be able to respond such as should it occur on our soils. Uh, and during the launch, uh, the ministers, both ministers signed a commitment uh, to biosecurity in South Africa and renewed focus. Um, incidentally, what I should also mention is that this story was born out of investment by the DSI in a research program coordinated by Grain SA, where we just, at, in 2016, we just started to look at a program for looking at quarantine pests and diseases uh, uh, in crops. And the project has grown, and through this program, we were able to invest in a, bio, a national biosecurity hub. Um, this slide just sort of shows you some of the work that's been done on fall, fall armyworm. So a lot of the work, you know, it's a combination of different aspects, both on the research side, putting the traps in the field, looking at heat maps, but also then collating that research information in terms of, of looking at the numbers, looking at the spread of the disease, and looking particularly where is it occurring, in which provinces, etc. Um, I'm not going to go into the d detail, but I can take questions. So, you know, through research and in innovation, we can get to this type of data that is more accurate, that is informative, that helps us as a country to make better decisions. Um, we also support skills. This is my last slide in terms of strengthening uh, agricultural innovation systems by supporting not just masters and PhDs, but technicians, some co-funded with industry, supporting entrepreneurship, uh, enabling retraining and training of extensions officers so they can provide better, assist the farmers with better s decisions and access to these digital systems. Um, so with that, uh, I thank you. And with that, I completely real, I realized that I completely forgot to introduce myself at the start of today's event. Hi. A little bit late, uh, but better late than never. I'm Anneli Hutting. I'm a news anchor for ENCA, and I'm also a content producer. So I'm a storyteller, um, and story about advances are, are my daily bread and butter. So that's probably why I'm here, and not because of my complete lack of tech savviness. One thing that stood out from... Um, Dr. Jagmohan Naidu's uh, presentation for me was the word innovation. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, because of ESCOM, we'll have to innovate and I'll have to use my big yeah. word. <laughs> so, innovate comes from the Latin word, innovare, which means to renew, renew. And I think if we think to quite a famous quote from Albert Einstein. He said that madness is doing the same thing and expecting a different result. Mm -hmm. So part of what forms the absolute basis for advancements and innovation in technology, uh, whether it's in any other field or specifically agriculture, is changing the way we do things. And that's what we're really looking forward to with Africa AgriTech, is an opportunity to bring people together from lots of different countries and we really want to put a focus on on lots of international as well as local experts with this next uh, conference that we're endeavoring uh, in 2023 so but when we're looking to change we also have to look at the future and what we expect from the future and how we do that is sometimes by looking at the horizon I know everyone in Joburg in Pretoria at the moment, maybe Pretoria has already had some rains, but is scanning the horizon to see when are these proper rain clouds coming. Uh, and in very similar ways, anyone in technology and innovation is scanning the future of the horizon to see 
what are the problems we're dealing with now and how are they changing in the future? How do we need to adapt the ways we react to those challenges to make sure that we're geared so that, like Kriyashi, we don't just react, we're prepared with data uh, to make those important decisions early on. So we scan the horizon and we look at forecasts from clever people like you all in the audience uh, for some plausible ideas of how technology uh, and technological advances may shape our future. And there are many ideas on the big ways in which the world is likely to change uh, in the coming years. Huge change, was it? And those changes are all naturally responses to those big problems we face, providing uh, <coughs> solutions for access. And this is another very big, important word. Access to energy, finance, commerce, products, access to information. So solutions that make access quicker, cheaper, easier, and more widespread. Essentially, all technology is about connecting the dots, connecting people to things, things to things, things to systems for implementation. Let's look at those forecasts then. Africa Agritech, like I said, is host, hoping to host a number of international and local experts. <coughs> and some of the future forecasts that we're going to be looking at, the war for the consumer relationship. We know we're dealing with ever increasingly picky consumers, more alert, aware, informed consumers who want to make informed decisions about the products they buy. And the war for their attention uh, provides a big space for technological advancement. Regional redesign, that's one of the forecasts where we're going to have to look at how systems work better. Outside solutions to climate change. Climate change is another buzzword. It's going to be there for the foreseeable future. I'm glad you can see this as well now. Um, the searchable food web. Imagine buying a product or thinking about buying a product and being able to go online to see its actual origin. Imagine buying a product that you know exactly where it comes from, how it was made, and with what kind of sustainable method so that you can choose products that are not only healthy, but that fit in with your personal value systems. Ever more consumers are looking for ways to engage with products that mirror their values. So it's not just these are my personal values and I choose to live them out in what I do, but also in my, con my informed purchases. So we want to look through Africa Agritech beyond emerging technologies towards the world within those technologies and the businesses of the future will operate. And we want to talk about some of these buzzwords again. So we've heard a couple of them. Global trade, regulatory environments and traceability are going to become increasingly important. And along with that, global biosecurity systems. We've seen the importance of biosecurity here in South Africa on, on the meat, red meat industry. That is going to change drastically uh, as we look at new diseases and the way they impact the global trade environment. Agfintech, another key buzzword. Regenerative agriculture, as we look at the impact of climate change and ways to, to produce food in a more environmentally sustainable way. Food cybersecurity. I mean, who would have thought, I mean, these days, uh, you still have to try and sort of make sure that you bank in a way that is responsible and so that your information isn't, isn't accessed uh, by people who, who, who shouldn't be accessing it. But in the future, food cybersecurity is going to be a thing we all need to pay attention to. Um, so farm management platforms like Hydra, by the Awareness Company, all those kind of developments are going to play a big role. Opportunities for intensification and diversification. Indoor and controlled environment farming as our access to vast tracts of agricultural land shrinks over time. And we heard at a recent conference from a number of international farmers, uh, one of them from Argentina, one of them from the USA, another from Germany, and one from Canada. And one of the things that they all had in common was that access 
to farmland is becoming increasingly difficult, not only as land prices increase, uh, but as industrial environments and urban environments encroach on traditional farming space. We're going to have to look at farming in different ways to use the land that we have and to use less land more productively. Broadband investments, next generation biological and information technologies, crop pharmacology, the design of organisms to fight new diseases. So instead of just fighting pests and diseases through chemicals, fight them through nature's own resources. Biosecurity, critical issue worldwide, as we've said. Advances in monitoring systems for disease diagnosis. And that goes beyond that. Monitoring systems, sensors on everything that we touch and interact with to get access to that data. GMO footprint for Africa and the world beyond. And the use of algorithms and data to offer a layer of real-time risk assessment. So the risks are going to change, and we need to assess those risks in real time to make sure we adjust to those. So those are just, again, some of the buzzwords that we're going to be looking at at Africa Agritech 2023. So a platform for all. That's what we are saying Africa Agritech is. A place where biotechnology and genetics can find expression, climate smart agriculture, farm technology, indoor agriculture. All of these specialists can come together, whether that's from primary production, from the value chain, from processing, from distribution, logistics, packaging, all of those sectors hopefully can converge in this platform a versatile marketing platform. So we're going to be showcasing solutions and technology through uh, live demonstration opportunities. Offers access to new markets. Companies can gather leads about their, cl their clients and other businesses that they'd like to partner with. There's a focused audience attending this conference, pro providing an exceptional opportunity to engage with them on issues that they are interested in amplifying brand awareness. You can position your brand as an innovative industry leader. Demonstrate solutions and gain instant feedback from those attending uh, those demonstrations, both physically and online. And this is very important, I think, for everyone after COVID. We've now had some time to reintegrate ourselves into contact, so maybe some people are hoping for a chance to distance themselves already, uh, but to regain the value of in-person contact and relationships with clients that maybe in many cases you haven't seen for a long time. And explore those innovation and venture capital opportunities. And this is in our uh, venture capital alley. Uh, where people have the opportunity to pitch innovation ideas to, to people we, that we know have cash in pocket to invest in the kind of technologies that we're looking to see in the future. So how can you engage at Africa Agritech? Like I said, there's opportunities for live demonstrations. Uh, you can be an exhibitor on the expo floor. You can sponsor a global speaker. I know many of you have access to international experts, the kind of people that we want to draw to Africa Agritech to take part. You can participate in various sponsorship opportunities. There are folders as you exit uh, with numerous of those opportunities, so you can have a look through that. You can endorse the event. Many of you have had a long-standing relationship uh, with the people behind Africa Agritech um, and know what goes into this to be able to endorse that. You can engage with foreign trade partners. And there, like we said, uh, over 100 hours of online uh, interviews, seven hours of radio and television interviews. There are extensive opportunities for media engagement at Africa Agritech. So, save the date, 14th to the 16th of March, 2023. Our website, www.africaagritech.co.za. There's lots of detailed information on participation opportunities that are available on our website. Please do go and engage with us there. Uh, feel free to send us your questions, uh, your suggestions, um, and we look forward to, to seeing you there. Thank you for your time, first of all. Thank you for bearing with us through the technical issues, the load shedding. I know you don't have a choice, but we're all getting used to it. And it's great to see smiles instead of frowns when something like that happens. Please do uh, 
join us for some refreshments outside. Fadnet and the team are standing by uh, to take your questions and to, to help you in any way we can. We look forward to seeing you at Africa AgriTech 2023.